Picture a quiet morning at a shipyard fog rolling off the water, cranes like giant metal skeletons standing silent against the sky. Now imagine one of those steel giants swinging a section of a warship the size of a small house and getting it exactly right, down to a few millimeters. Sounds ordinary? Here's the twist. Nearly 90% of the world's gantry cranes, the massive machines that do that precise lifting, are made in one country, China. That fact matters because these cranes don't just move metal. They're the unsung engineers of modern power. When a navy builds a cutting-edge stealth frigate, every heavy piece must be lifted and placed with surgical precision. A single mistake can cost millions, delay a ship for months, or even ruin a sensitive stealth coating. So the question becomes, who makes the cranes, who controls the parts and software, and what happens if you refuse to buy from the dominant supplier? Today's story begins with a bold choice and a bad day. India, trying to avoid dependence on China after political tensions, chose a non-Chinese crane for a top-secret warship project. On paper, it looked smart. In practice, a gust of wind nearly wrecked the ship mid-assembly. That near disaster is our entry point, not because cranes are dramatic on their own, but because the machines that lift a nation's biggest projects also lift its strategic choices. At first glance, a gantry crane just looks like a slow, heavy machine, a giant metal frame rolling on tracks. But in modern shipbuilding, it's the heart of the operation. Think of trying to build a skyscraper laid flat on the ground. That's what making a warship is like. Each section weighs hundreds of tons, and every lift has to be exact, not just close. That's where gantry cranes come in. They act like robotic surgeons, picking up modules the size of houses and lowering them into place with millimeter precision. Modern cranes aren't simple machines either. Many use GPS alignment, laser sensors, and automated balance controls. The best can even adjust their grip when the wind picks up or when tides shift the ship below. Without them, modular shipbuilding, the fast, efficient method used by today's navies, would be impossible. So when a nation decides which crane to use, it's not a minor purchase. It's a decision that can literally hold up or drop a country's defense strategy. Just 25 years ago, the world's top gantry cranes came from places like the United States, Japan, and Germany. But today, nearly nine out of every 10 are built in China. How did that happen so fast? Well, it started with China's national goal in the early 2000s to become the world's shipbuilding powerhouse. Beijing poured billions into coastal industrial zones, giant areas in Shanghai, Dalian, and Guangzhou, where ships, engines, and heavy machinery were all built side by side. When China began making its own cranes, it didn't just copy old designs. It scaled up and innovated. State-backed companies like ZPMC started building faster, cheaper, and smarter than anyone else. Their cranes had advanced software, precision sensors, and digital control systems that rivaled Western tech, but at a fraction of the cost. Soon, every major port and shipyard wanted one. Chinese cranes could be delivered in months, customized to local needs, and financed through easy loans. One deal at a time, China lifted itself from newcomer to unchallenged global leader. At first glance, a gantry crane seems harmless just a massive tool built to lift steel. But behind every sale is a subtle form of economic diplomacy. When a country buys Chinese cranes, it's rarely just buying machines. It's often buying a full package, installation, maintenance, financing, and sometimes even the software that controls the system. That means years of dependence on Chinese technicians, spare parts, and updates. This isn't just commerce, it's influence through infrastructure. You can see it from Africa to Europe. Take Croatia's Peljašac Bridge, built by a Chinese state-owned company using Chinese cranes. It wasn't only about construction, it was a strategic foothold inside the European Union. Each project like that extends China's industrial reach a little further. So, when a nation decides to reject Chinese equipment, it's not simply a technical decision, it's a political act, and that's exactly what India did. The result was bold, patriotic, and as we'll see, risky. For India, 
the decision began with pride and caution. The country was building its next-generation stealth warships under Project 17A, a massive naval modernization plan. These frigates were designed to be quiet, radar-resistant, and packed with advanced systems. Every part of their construction depended on precise, heavy lifts, the kind only high-end gantry cranes could handle. Originally, India had chosen a British supplier, but then came an alarming discovery. The cranes weren't really British. They were manufactured in China. The revelation hit at the worst possible time. After the deadly 2020 border clashes in Ladakh, public sentiment and politics made any Chinese-built system in a defense project unacceptable. For New Delhi, the choice became symbolic. Using Chinese cranes would look like depending on a rival for critical military infrastructure. So India made a bold stand, no Chinese cranes, no matter the cost. The question was, could anyone else deliver that same precision and scale? After rejecting Chinese cranes, India turned to a country it deeply trusted, Japan. The decision looked perfect on paper. Japan had a long record of building world-class machinery. Its companies were known for reliability, and politically, it was a close strategic partner. Both nations had been strengthening ties under the Indo-Pacific Alliance, working together on infrastructure, defense, and technology. Japan's offer came with something India valued even more, neutrality. There were no hidden geopolitical strings, no fear of backdoors or data risks. For India, this wasn't just about buying cranes. It was about asserting tech sovereignty, the idea that a nation should control the critical tools behind its defense projects. So, a Japanese-made gantry crane rated for 250 tons was chosen and installed at an Indian naval dockyard. Engineers felt confident. Politicians felt vindicated. India had stood its ground and still found a trusted partner. Everything looked promising until nature tested that confidence in the most unexpected way. It was supposed to be a routine day at the dockyard. Engineers were guiding a massive steel module, part of a stealth frigate, into position under clear skies. The Japanese-built gantry crane moved smoothly, its motors humming like clockwork. Then, out of nowhere, the weather changed. A sharp gust of coastal wind swept across the yard. Within seconds, the calm became chaos. The crane began to sway. Sirens blared as workers scrambled for safety. The suspended module, hundreds of tons of steel, shifted off balance. Metal screamed against metal. One of India's most advanced warships, still half complete, was caught in the danger zone. Before the operators could react, a violent gust hit again. The crane buckled under the stress, twisting slightly before the emergency locks engaged. But it was too late. A section of the stealth frigate was damaged. No one was seriously hurt, but the dockyard fell silent. In a single afternoon, a project worth billions was suddenly delayed, all because of a crane that couldn't handle the wind. The Japanese crane didn't fail because it was poorly made. It failed because it wasn't made for India's environment. Japan's engineering philosophy focuses heavily on earthquake resistance. Their cranes are built with flexible joints, shock absorbers, and base isolators designed to survive powerful tremors. But India's coastal shipyards face a different threat, high, unpredictable winds. In simple terms, the crane's structure could absorb vertical shaking but wasn't built to resist strong sideways wind pressure. Without enough lateral bracing and wind-locking mechanisms, the long horizontal beam acted like a giant sail. When the gust hit, it twisted under stress. Imagine holding a wide sheet of metal in a storm. It's not the weight that beats you. It's the side force. This wasn't bad engineering. It was misapplied engineering. A machine designed for seismic safety had been placed in a wind-heavy zone. That mismatch turned a cutting-edge tool into a weak link. The aftermath was brutal. The damaged crane had to be shut down immediately, halting the entire shipbuilding operation.
Each day of delay meant lost time, idle workers, and rescheduled military deadlines. The warship under construction, one of India's Project 17 Stealth frigates, couldn't move forward until the crane was repaired or replaced. Experts estimated the total setback at nearly 70 crore rupees, or around $8 million in direct losses, not counting the ripple effects. Contracts had to be renegotiated, new parts imported, and the dockyard's credibility questioned. What was meant to symbolize India's independence from Chinese machinery had now become an expensive embarrassment. Worse, the episode exposed how fragile defense logistics can be. One failed crane, just one, delayed a multi-billion dollar modernization effort. Politicians faced criticism. Had India rushed too fast to de-China its defense sector without ensuring technical compatibility? This was no longer about engineering. It had become a lesson in how geopolitics and pride can collide with physics and precision. India could have quietly blamed the supplier and moved on. But instead, it treated the failure as a wake-up call. The Navy launched an internal investigation. Engineers reviewed every bolt and beam, and the government began re-evaluating its procurement philosophy. Not just for cranes, but for all critical defense infrastructure. The takeaway was clear. Make in India had to mean more than assembling foreign technology. It meant mastering the design, stress analysis, and environmental adaptation of every component used in national projects. In response, India started encouraging domestic heavy equipment firms and research labs to develop indigenous crane systems tailored to local conditions, resistant not only to earthquakes, but to coastal winds, humidity, and salinity. Meanwhile, Japan cooperated transparently, helping fix the issue and reinforce the crane with additional wind bracing. The diplomatic relationship remained intact, proof that strategic trust can survive technical failure. The incident turned from scandal to strategy shift, inspiring India to build smarter, not just prouder. The crane failure became more than an isolated mishap. It symbolized India's crossroads between national pride and practical capability. It showed that independence isn't just about rejecting foreign products. It's about creating technology strong enough to stand on its own. In the years that followed, India doubled down on its Atmanirbhar Bharat, or self-reliant India, mission. Domestic shipyards began collaborating with Indian Institutes of Technology to design next-generation gantry cranes built for tropical climates and coastal storms. Policies were reworked to ensure every defense import underwent environment-specific stress testing before approval. The lessons echoed beyond India. Across the world, nations realized that geopolitical purity can't replace engineering precision. Pride is powerful but performance decides survival. Today that damaged crane stands not as a mark of failure, but as a reminder. In modern geopolitics, even a piece of steel can carry the weight of sovereignty. Picture the scene one last time. A quiet shipyard at dusk, the sea glinting gold as engineers walk beneath the towering frame of a repaired gantry crane. The same crane that once faltered in the wind now stands reinforced stronger, steadier, symbolic. That steel giant tells a deeper story, the story of a nation learning to rise not just through defiance, but through design. India's decision to reject Chinese cranes was an act of courage. Its choice to learn from failure was an act of maturity. Together they mark the real journey of progress, the kind that doesn't happen overnight, but through trial, tension, and transformation. In global politics, wars aren't only fought with weapons anymore. They're fought with machines, materials, and mastery. And every bolt tightened in that dockyard whispers the same truth. Independence isn't declared. It's engineered. The next time you see a crane towering over a harbor, remember? It might just be holding up more than steel. It might be holding up a nation's pride. Since that day, India's shipyards have changed quietly but profoundly. New cranes rise, 
not from foreign blueprints, but from Indian mines. The Naval Design Bureau now partners directly with local manufacturers to ensure every component meets both technical and strategic standards. Wind tunnels test structures before they touch the docks. Data from coastal weather systems feed into design software. Every failure's lesson has been translated into progress. Even more telling, countries across Southeast Asia have begun consulting Indian firms for advice on environment fit engineering, flipping the old script. The student has become the teacher, and in this evolution lies a truth that defines the 21st century. Sovereignty isn't about isolation, but adaptation. The world's next great powers will not simply buy technology, they'll understand it, shape it, and make it their own. Because in the end, the true measure of strength isn't how loudly a nation declares independence, it's how silently it builds it. Every story of progress hides a moment of failure, and India's crane crisis was exactly that. But what makes nations great isn't that they never stumble, it's that they turn every stumble into a stepping stone. That broken crane became more than a cautionary tale, it became a blueprint for resilience. It taught India, and perhaps the world, that global independence starts with local understanding. Engineering is never just metal and math, it's philosophy in motion. It reflects how a country thinks, builds, and believes in itself. As India's next fleet of warships rises, each one carries a quiet legacy. The day wind humbled steel, and forced innovation to take root. So, the next time the winds blow through a shipyard in Visakhapatnam or Kochi, those gusts won't bring fear. They'll remind everyone there that the strength of a nation isn't tested by calm seas, but by how it stands when the storm arrives. This isn't just a story about cranes. It's a story about courage, craftsmanship, and the cost of true independence.